Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the SAMS webinar talk. It is uh, sponsored by the Ohio, Ohio chapter of the Syrian American Medical Society. I think we have so far 27 participants. I think the projection is probably 95 or more. So welcome everybody. For the people who's part of the SAMS, welcome. For the people who's not part of the SAMS, just few words about the SAMS. It's non-political uh, humanitarian organization that involved with helping the unfortunate uh, Syrian and non-Syrian, and also it's involved enhancing the education and communication of the professional that belong to the society. Uh, our first webinar as part of the Ohio chapter will be discussing the COVID crisis that's going on all over the world and in the United States and specifically in Ohio. We all know that so far we have 1.8 million cases and more than 100 deaths you know, all over the United States and even the state, we have probably more than half a million and more than 20,000 deaths so far. And to help us enlighten uh, that subject, we invited three of our guests to educate us about uh, uh, taking care of the patient who has COVID. So we have three pulmonologists and critical care. Uh, the first one, Dr. Yasser Tarabishi. He is the Director of Clinical Informatics, uh, Assistant Professor, Case Western mm -hmm. Mental Health Medical Center. Then we have Dr. Uh, Ammar Ghannam. He's a uh, pulmonary and clinical care specialist, part of Michigan State University. Then we have Dr. Muhammad Abdelghani Hamadi. He's a Chief Section of Advocate Christ Hospital. Associate Professor at University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, the way we're gonna present this, first thing, Dr. Tarabishi will talk about the COVID prevalence, incidents, and presentations. Then we're gonna have Dr. Ammar, who's in the front line taking care of COVID patient in Michigan. And we know all that Michigan hit badly with the recent COVID crisis. Then we have Dr. Abdel Ghani, who's going to probably give us a crash course about non-invasive ventilation and taking care of the ventilator in case one of us end up taking care of one of those patients in the ICU or on the floor on the ventilator. So with all further ado, uh, I will introduce Dr. Yasser Tarabishi. Yasser, are you there? Yasir. Uh, Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, I need to share my slides, but I think somebody else is sharing. So you can you can take over. Oh, there it is. All right. Is that up? Yeah. Okay. So I think I. Uh, you know, I think I can talk about this for hours, obviously, but uh, the format we decided on was was to develop a little bit of a primer and then hopefully launch into more practical discussion. And so in that spirit, I think, you know, I, I look through the currently available literature. I, I have some insights into what my healthcare system has been doing in preparation for this, uh, for the surge that we may or may not see. Uh, and I think what I tried to do was really provide the evidence and data that's basically going to be reflective in current management decisions. And so I've done my best to distill practical data for providers who are joining the front line. And so I may have admitted fascinating or peculiar aspects of the disease if they're not management changing. And this is kind of a selective data-driven survival guide is, is what I'm thinking for the average provider. <clears throat> and so I'm going to start with, uh, you know, some local news. Uh, here's the, uh, one of the headlines from the Washington Post that Ohio get it right. Early intervention preparation for the pandemic may pay off. Cautious optimism is warranted, I think. We've flattened the curve is what it looks like we've done so far. Um, but, but this is, you know, a, a little bit of a, of a warning here. So, yes, we flattened the curve. Maybe we'll be, you know, at this position where, where we have throttled the number of, uh, throttled the incidence of disease enough that the healthcare system can, can handle the volume. But the reality is the people that are at risk have not disappeared. 
We don't have herd immunity. We don't really have strong viable treatment options and the vaccine is really far from development. So what I'm trying to say here is be optimistic. That's great, but we can't let our, uh, our guard down. We need to stay vigilant. Uh, when social distancing breaks down, we're gonna see more cases. And then actually increasingly, uh, you know, leaders across the state have, have basically pointed to the likelihood of local outbreaks, particularly things like nursing homes. And so there's every possibility that you can have regional outbreaks that can overwhelm a single hospital system. So I think this is still going to be relevant. We're going to be talking about COVID for, for months to come, if not longer. I'll remind everybody that the 1918 pandemic really took about two years to, to trickle through. Okay. So again, trying to stick with the pragmatic stuff. What do we know about transmission? There's a lot of debate on this, and I think a lot of, a lot of confusion that's uh, developed since the CDC has been talking about masks for everybody. But the basic idea, based on what we know so far, it's primarily droplets. Droplets that uh, we produce coughing, sneezing, and talking, and by extension, droplets can land on surfaces, and you, know, you touch the surface, you touch any of your mucous membranes, that's how you can get, how that you can get COVID into your system. Um, Classically speaking, very contagious disease like measles, if you look at the figure here on the right, have multiple mechanisms of transmission, but basically the concern is aerosolization, where you have small, what the figure is calling small floating droplet nuclei that can go meters out and can linger viable in the air for some period of time, estimates of hours. And so I'm sure everybody knows about the R0s for a lot of these you know, diseases in terms of how many people, one individual person can infect with measles, it's 10 to 20. So far with COVID, it's looking less two to three, some estimates are closer to five, but it's not quite consistent with the pattern that you would see if it really was truly aerosolized and if, and if, uh, you know, if it spread like measles would, for instance. Um, now, I know that there's some data, they've aerosolized it in a lab setting, they've shown that it can stay in the air for three hours, but that is not proof of viable route of transmission. And for my gastroenterologist friends, you know, we know that we've seen the, the, uh, the um, nucleic material and fecal matter, and actually it's been sampled in air near toilets, so that's a viable transmission, uh, you know, or sorry, a, a viable pathway where it might be aerosolized, but there's no clear proof of, of a viable fecal transmission, so like a fecal oral or anything like that to this point. And so the take home here is all evidence is pointing to droplets. That's what you have to worry the most about. Are there unique circumstances where we might be able to generate aerosolized uh, smaller, uh, you know, foci for infection? It's possible. It's not totally clear yet. But because we know things like MERS and, and SARS potentially did that, I think it's a reasonable concern to have. So as far as shedding goes, and this is, this is essentially one of the biggest problems with this, we can see shedding, and, and this is based on a number of different theories, primarily from China and Singapore, 10 to 30 plus days, median of 20 days in survivors. And for those that don't survive, they keep shedding until they die. Um, there's even some degree of shedding after clinical recovery, but obviously the significance of that is unclear. So again, just because you're shedding doesn't mean you're doing it in a way or at a quantity enough that's, that, that's going to necessarily facilitate transmission. And one of the biggest kind of news items in the last month is the issue of pre or asymptomatic shedding. And there's some simulation studies. Again, it's based on you know, tracking infected individuals to see if they may have transmitted it to somebody else, so case, case tracking, that may account for six to 12% of transmission. And that's based on data from Singapore and China as well. What we do know based on prior, you know, prior aerosolized illnesses, aerosolization is particularly problematic and more so in the things that we do in the hospital. And so I'm gonna take a moment to go through this list. Nebulizer treatments, chest physical therapy, CPR, intubation, bagging, extubation, High flow nasal cannula, you're throwing in air at you know, up to 60 liters per minute that can aerosolize material. Uh, Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, which is CPAP and BICAP, and obviously things like bronchoscopy. And so even the benign things that you wouldn't, con you know, you know nebulizer treatments we use in the ED all the time or in the hospital all the time, that's something to be concerned about. Uh, and I think a lot of hospitals' policies have been now to, to ban nebulizer treatments in anybody who's under investigation. Okay, so here's where I think I'm gonna seep a little bit into being a little bit more opinionated about this, and, and we're gonna talk about this inevitably, but I just wanted to throw it out there. Um, in the time that I have, I don't think I can discuss the, the non-specific presentation that COVID uh, you know, that presents with, essentially. Uh, I really think it's highly non-specific, and it's frankly indistinguishable from other viral illnesses. Fever, cough, sore throat, what have you. Some GI symptoms I know uh, we've talked about. 
And I think from a, a presentation and diagnostic perspective, and I think this is particularly true mostly for our region and as time has gone on through this pandemic, if you can, if you can check for SARS-CoV-2, if you can do the PCR, that's the most important thing you can do. Now you can get surrogate blood work, one of the more prominent things that has appeared in the context of the illness is lymphopenia, which is also a prognosticator. Um, you know, there's a laundry list of these things like a low or normal procalcitonin, which may help you, but in reality, a high procalcitonin is associated with, with bad prognosis in COVID. So having a high procalcitonin doesn't mean you don't have COVID. And it also definitely doesn't mean, for instance, that you have secondary bacterial infection, which is a whole other discussion uh, we can have later. As far as imaging goes, and this is, this is what's interesting as far as what, uh, I think China kind of set the precedent here. So one of their diagnostic criteria, if they didn't trust their test or if they didn't have the test, is to get CT scans on everybody. Um, the, the US experience, and I think guidelines from the uh, radiology societies is basically to not get CAT scans. Just bear in mind that x-rays can be normal 30% of the time, but if you see any kind of infiltrates, usually bilateral, ground glass, that kind of an appearance, um, that should increase your pretest probability for COVID. The reason why, again, I hedge with, with imaging is, you know, I think it's useful for differential diagnoses. It's useful if you don't have the actual PCR, but heck, if you can do the exam and, and you have enough of a concern about it, just, uh, sorry, the PCR, just do the PCR. So again, I'm not going to go into this too much detail. There's plenty of examples online for, for what, what the CAT scans look like. Here, I think, is the more interesting thing. So I'm making the assumption that all of us have some access to testing. That was not the case a few weeks ago. Now I think it's a little more prominent or, or prevalent. That is the gold standard that we have. Here's the other thing. False negatives have been reported. Some of that may be due to technique or possibly a low viral load at the time of sampling, although if they present to the hospital, the latter part's unlikely. With some data from China and serology being the gold standard, the sensitivity is close to 90% you know, as of the specificity, which is really impressive. But I think just, you know, if you can go back to the confusion matrix and your step one, you know, uh, uh, table of, of sensitivity, specificity, positive, and negative predicted values, these test characteristics are really good in general. But your negative and positive predictive values are highly dependent on the disease prevalence in your situation. And in a pandemic, that changes quickly. So, for instance, a negative test in somebody presenting with, with respiratory failure in Lombardi is much less believable than a negative test would be in Cleveland. And so the context, your, your pretest probability depends entirely on the prevalence of the condition in your situation. And you have to interpret the test accordingly. And I think this curve is essentially showing you that, that as the, percent, the prevalence of the disease goes up, the positive predictive value uh, goes up, the negative predictive value goes down. So if you have a negative value, when almost everybody in your, in your area has the disease, you're probably less inclined to, 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 to believe that. And the reason I, I focus on this is because I think as a clinician, especially at the front line, if you think this person has it and the result is negative, that's not an indication for you to let down your guard. I think you need to treat them as, as a person under investigation until you've basically done a couple of extra things, maybe repeat the test or discuss with your local uh, ID uh, docs. This is something we've seen that's happened in our healthcare system. People aren't doing the nasopharyngeal swab correctly. And so what I would recommend you do is take a look at this video. It's an NEJM video. It goes deeper than you think it would. Uh, you know, people call it a brain biopsy sometimes, but the reality is the angle is, is, is it's pretty much level. It's not going up towards the, the, um, the actual brain. And so I, I think if, if people aren't squaring with discomfort and if you haven't stuck at least half of the swab in there, you may have not done it correctly. And obviously the implications of that are, are vast. Okay. What do we know about the course of the disease? Now, here's something that I've been, I've been watching, you know, it's, it's been very interesting. So a lot of anecdotal evidence that there's different phenotypes of the disease, different kinds of respiratory failure that might develop. But the reality is, I mean, these are very interesting things. At the end of the day, it doesn't necessarily change what you do in the moment. So there's, it's not gonna create a different evidence-based path in therapy. Um, also anecdotally, which is something that everybody has talked about but have not seen the actual data for, patients can experience a rapid, a rapid decline that is difficult to predict. So somebody's fine one moment and then within an hour or two, they're, they're getting intubated. And so I think these are things to keep in mind, but I can't speak to them in terms of actual prevalence of that kind of a condition. Now, the best data for course of disease obviously comes from China. Uh, and, you know, I think this is a nice little heat map that gives you a sense for how long the course of the illness 
appears to be before people get into trouble. And the median time to sepsis, for instance, is nine days from symptoms, and ARDS is 12 days. And the plots here are basically survivors versus non-survivors. The other thing to know is the majority of people, at least again in the Chinese experience, which is definitely going to be biased, uh, there's probably more asymptomatic people, um, more mild cases, 80%, severe 14%, critical 5%, and the case fatality rate uh, tends to primarily go along age, and I'm, I'm going to discuss that in a minute. Um, but, you know, I think the, the, the take home here is there seems to be, at least for the most part, a pretty long run in time between the development of symptoms and, and more severe illness. What we know about mortality is also completely all over the map. So all bets are off. We don't have high quality surveillance serologic data. I think Iceland might be the closest place to that. Um, and they have a case fatality rate that's well under 1%. Um, but, you know, you have to sample your entire population or do at least a controlled serologic assessment to really know how deadly this is. But the numbers are going to obviously be biased towards the severity of illness and aging populations, which is one of the arguments that, that uh, you know, uh, the Italian experience has brought forth. Again, generally speaking, probably going to be somewhere close to 1%. Again, we don't know until we have more information. As far as the reasons why people die of this disease. It's primarily respiratory failure, but there's a growing uh, amount of data that's pointing to cardiac manifestations, primarily cardiomyopathy. Uh, interestingly, not necessarily a viral myocarditis in the classic sense, somewhere closer to a, a stress cardiomyopathy. Again, I think it's still unclear. We don't have enough patholo pathologic data. So limited autopsy series here. Um, this is an interesting discussion that keeps coming up. Is this ARDS. Well, the, you know, of the few cases that people have actually looked at in terms of, you know, post, uh, post death autopsies, primarily alveolar, diffuse alveolar damage, which is the pathological equivalent of ARDS. And again, no direct evidence of viral myocarditis. So just a little bit of information to kind of color your, your perspective here. I've been asked to touch on prognostication. I'm a huge data buff, so always happy to talk about data. I'm going to give you my, my kind of summary here for what's out there. Uh, age is by far been the most clearly correlated with risk of mortality. Male gender has held true in every, in every country that's been impacted. I, you know, initially in China, the thought was more men smoked. They had more chronic lung disease. Maybe that's why they're more impacted. But generally speaking, it's still held. Uh, cardiovascular disease, the obvious ones, diabetes, chronic lung disease, and cancer seem to have higher risk for mortality or have higher risk for mortality in cohorts that have been published to date. You can use um, a bunch of blood work. I'm going to look at the right panel now. Uh, all of the inflammatory markers, D-dimers, ferritins, LDH, C-reactive protein, uh, C uh, C CRPs, uh, troponins, and, and, and the only kind of variation that we typically may not have expected is the lymphocyte count in which a lower lymphocyte count pretends a, a great mortality. And what you see in these plots is a separation between survivors and non-survivors. I don't know that necessarily as an intensivist, any of this, you know, it, it surprises me, to be honest. And you can generally, moving to more uh, kind of surrogate measures or, or, or um, composite measures, the SOFA score is another one. So a SOFA score over five, so the sequential organ failure assessment, it's, it's multi-organs, uh, it's a scoring for mul uh, multiple organs for the degree of impairment and a score over five, much higher risk for mortality in hospitalized patients. The problem with it is it's not specific for COVID. And so, you know, we'll see, for instance, less uh, liver failure, if you will, uh, which, again, the SOFA score might capture, but at the end of the day, what I'm trying to say about all these indicators is these are all things that we expect in critical illness. And, and I don't think I'm surprised by any of them. There's still not a great prognosticator in terms of a simple score that people have developed. The closest thing that I found, and the problem is a lot of this literature is in preprint. Um, the, the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, which is already an established measure of severity of illness and prognostication, CRP and D-dimer, if you use those in concert, just in, in isolation, uh, they had a pretty good negative predictive value for what the Chinese call severe pneumonia. So usually somebody who ended up in the ICU. And so that's the closest thing that I can tell you. Again, my biggest problem with all of these is these are non-externally validated scoring systems. Uh, and I think this is universally true. Your threshold for sending somebody home to a floor ICU or step down, unit is going to be incredibly fluid and very dependent on the local capacities, practices, and situation on the ground. 
So if you have the luxury of space on a regular floor and somebody has one medical comorbidity, you might be compelled to put them on the floor. But if your regular floor is, is bursting at the seams, and, I, and you know, our Michigan colleagues can talk to us about this, on some level, you're going to have to increase your comfort with sending people home or at least putting them in, a, in, in, in some kind of an in-between situation where they're being monitored. I know our, our experience at Metro is we've uh, one or two comorbidities. If they look okay, we'll send them home, but somebody's calling them ideally on average once a day to check in on them and see what they're do how they're doing. Again, the volume so far is manageable. So the plan is going to vary depending on the resources. And I think at the end of the day, you know, common clinical sense should prevail. We've talked a lot about in our institution about blood work and whether or not we can use that to facilitate triage or prognostication. But the reality is we really don't know what to do with that stuff. And more so you're in increasing nurse and lab contacts with the patient which is putting your, uh, your staff at risk, potentially. So here's a simple protocol, just because I felt compelled to throw one up. Uh, this is the University of Washington's protocol. And it's, it's very logical. It's you know, low risk based on risk factors and comorbidity, which includes comorbidities. They look okay, you, know, you could send them home. Any more comorbidities with a positive test, you might want to watch them if you have the room. And any, any compromise to the respiratory system that's a system as evidenced by, uh, evidence by drop in saturations or increase in respiratory rate makes you think about placing them uh, in an intensive care unit. And so, I, you know, I, I just left that in there for reference, um, just to give you an example. And, and I want to circle back around to, to home here because I think this is a question that's come up a lot. Uh, we all know that healthcare workers are at greater risk. We are exposed. Uh, in a lot of situations, we're being pushed to practice with limited uh, protective equipment, I think. Also, to some degree, we're expected to, to exhaust ourselves and, and kind of work past it, right? Be, be heroes. The number of positive cases in Ohio of healthcare workers is about 20%. So this is a very real problem. And I'm going to jump into why that there's, this is a problem. And I, and I read this, you know, uh, somebody wrote this, and I think it, it was very well stated. There is no emergency in a pandemic. This is a war, not a battle. And what you have to realize is you as a healthcare worker, and that includes you and your staff, nursing, and, and everybody, every, every part of that healthcare team, you're force multipliers. Valuable and effective, don't become a casualty and a burden on an already stressed system. And what that means is taking care of and protecting yourself is paramount. And wrapped into all that is guarding PPE reserves. And so there's multiple ways you can do that. I know in our healthcare system, you know, triage and care remotely when able is something that we're doing all the time. So even as a pulmonary consultant, if I'm in the ICU and I get a consult on the floor, we're using a video visit to take care of that. We're not tracking through the hospital. Multiple healthcare systems have reduced mingling of respiratory and non-respiratory pa uh, patients. So an ED for, uh, split the ED in half, respiratory and non-respiratory on the floors included. Minimize patient touches, consult using telehealth. And this is one that, you know, we've talked a lot about with our ethical and legal uh, consultants. The code situation seems to be the scariest one. We personally know of, of people in New York that have rushed into a code situation on the floor that have either ended up critically ill or dead. And so we made it a case to, 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 to really drive this point home, which is you don't go into the room until you yourself are protected. So that means PPE checking yourself, PPE checking your colleagues, and not doing anything that puts you at risk. Again, you want to win the war, not the battle. And the most important thing is, even if you're not on the front line yet, get fit tested, understand what your PPE options are available. I know a lot of non-pulmonary, non-hospitalist people have been kind of clued into current developments, but in Ohio, I, I don't know of any facilities that have gotten to the point where they're leaning on people that are not typically in these uh, settings in the hospital or the ICU to get involved with care. You know, think about it ahead of time, try to familiar, familiarize yourself with the practice. And I think, my final point here is, you know, we also we worry about the risk to ourselves, right, but also the risk to our families and others. And I'm going to bring this point back, which is outside of the aerosolizing procedures that we know, transmission seems to be primarily by droplets. And, and I said multiple studies have done air sampling. The closest they found to aerosolization is in a toilet. So, you know, the, at least one of the Chinese uh, Chinese studies. And then in both of the studies that, from Singapore and China that looked at air sampling for, for viable uh, virus, they both showed that standard room sanitation, so cleaning, dropped the presence to zero. 
And so, you know, I think that, yes, be very cautious and concerned, understand what the risks of transmission are, understand where it comes from. Uh, but at the same time, what I'm trying to say here is, is trust the system and tr trust your EVS colleagues. And then as far as taking things home, you know, if you're infected, again, this is another, another suggestion that this is really primarily droplets and not uh, aerosolized. Uh, the risk to an infected person, to somebody else in an infected person's household is about 10%, and among contacts, less than 1%, and this is data from the CDC. And so the recommendation is, and this is what I've, uh, you know, this is what I've done, uh, if I'm on service, I've contacted people with COVID, I will sleep in another room and I'll use my own bathroom and I'll maintain some distance. Again, asymptomatic, but I, I just want to be 100% cautious. Other healthcare facilities have, uh, have hotels. And in some situations, providers for concern for their loved ones, especially if they have somebody at home who's at high risk, have been basically staying away from their family after, you know, during and after being on service where they're in contact with COVID patients. So I think this is going to end up being an individual level decision. But the, the point of this last uh, point here is it's not, it's not 100%. It's not guaranteed. And if you could be cautious, it reduce the risk. And, you know, my only reconsideration would be if you have somebody at home that's either older or immunocompromised or has medical comorbidities, I think you might think again about how you would, uh, uh, you could potentially expose them if you, if you uh, go back to regular home situations. And I'm going to pass it on from there. Thank you. Thank you, Yasser, for the nice presentation and the overview of the symptoms, the diagnosis. And uh, I would open it up for a question before we move to the second presenter. And actually, I will start with the first question. You know, we as a healthcare provider, Definitely, we're at high risk from the data that you present and from the cases that we've seen. Are we at higher rate of morbidity, mortality? Are we exposed to higher load of viruses, considering that repetitive exposure from dealing with these patients than others? Right. So the, the suggestion anecdotally, I don't know that we have enough solid data to make this case, primarily because when you know, we're not testing everybody. But the, the anecdotal evidence is so we are overworked, fatigued, exhausted, and we have a higher viral load. And it would generally appear that there have been what look like younger people succumbing to more severe illness in the healthcare field. So definitely a concern. And I think in circumstances where, where proper PPE has been practiced, that is less evident. Uh, the other thing, too, is uh, a lot of the people that were exposed on the front line early on in the pandemic not really didn't really understand what they were dealing with were also more likely to, to, um, to have complications or more severe illness. And another question, I know we mentioned about the PPE for physicians and healthcare provider. I know most of the hospital has designated a section to taking care of COVID patients, but from practicality, there's some hospital putting mixed patients, some patients with COVID in separate rooms. How would you do that? Like from moving from COVID to non-COVID, you change everything and they put sometimes patients who are COVID suspicious. So you would change all the gear, all the N95 when you go to see them, all the gown, all the glasses and the goggles. Yep. Uh, so here's exactly the problem. So, you know, if you are dealing with a situation where your hospital system has become a COVID healthcare system, you don and you basically maintain the same protection throughout the day. But in situations where it's still mixed, the policy that we're trying to, at least in our healthcare system, achieve is you have respiratory and non-respiratory caretakers. And so whoever's taking care of the non-respiratory problems that are COVID rule outs or confirmed COVID does not cross. There's that, right? One, one is obviously everybody in the social risk, dying and dying multiple times and possibly spreading COVID. Uh, and the other one is primarily, and this is the, the, the management problem, it's, it's pr uh, protecting the PPE supplies. Because right. if you have to go in and out, you're wasting supplies. And so there's every rhyme and reason to try to separate into COVID and non-COVID, um, you know, situ uh, I guess, wards, if you will. I think a, a lot of healthcare systems are still struggling with that policy. I don't know that there's an ideal answer to it. Um, and I think it's easier when, in some ways, easier when your entire healthcare system gets swamped and all of a sudden most of everything is COVID and the exception is not. Um, for instance, we have a silly policy that I'll share where if somebody's under investigation but still PCR is pending and at high enough risk, they still go to the COVID unit. And, and the, and the um, rationalization for that is that if you really think that they likely have it, 
you'd better take a chance putting them in with everybody else who has COVID than putting them in on, a, on, another, on another unit. And maybe one out of five times, you know, we've been wrong, which means that person was exposed, unfortunately. Uh, obviously, we're not directly exposing it, but they, they're in the environment. Um, it's a tough, these are higher level management decisions, which I don't, I don't envy my colleagues who have to make these decisions, to be honest. Thank you. I have a question from a uh, neurologist, Dr. Rami Hashway. Uh, the question about necrotizing encephalop encephalopathy causing bleeding and death in COVID patient. Any data? I'd, I'd leave that to somebody who has a higher caseload. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen it. Uh, I've seen it discussed. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll for the sake of time, we'll move to the second presenter and we're gonna have hopefully plenty of time for questions at the end. Now we go to Dr. Ammar Ghanim. He, he is critical care and pulmonologist from Detroit, Michigan. Uh, he's been taking care of a lot of COVID patient on the front line and he has a lot of experience in taking care of them. Go ahead, uh, Ammar. You can share your screen. Double click to share the screen. Is it working? Amar? Start the screen sharing. I think I'll take over and um, do the share screen here from uh, Cleveland to help you. I think uh, he's having a bad connection. He's the VA hospital now in uh, Detroit. Uh, so I'm gonna actually uh, navigate from my computer. Okay, thank you Mazen, thank you. Is Amar there? I think we might lost connection with him. I so what, what he can do. Maybe we can leave him till the end. Uh, if uh, Dr. Abdul Ghani Hamadi. Can you, Abdul Ghani, can you take over? Can we do your presentation? Then maybe we'll leave his presentation till the end. Um, can you Ammar see my screen? Hamar is coming back. Oh, he is, okay. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm sorry for the technical issue. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we can hear you. Uh, okay, so I would like uh, to thank you for having me uh, today. And thank you, Yasser, for the nice presentation. Um, I also would like to take the chance and thank the organizer, uh, Dr. Hazem and Dr. Mazen, for putting all the effort on organizing this meeting. Um, also, don't forget about Sam's efforts uh, to educate and support the healthcare providers during this crisis. Mm -hmm. Um, like today, I would like to focus on my presentation on mainly uh, on patient uh, uh, presentation, initial presentation, risk stratification, uh, uh, admission, which patient that they need it can be treated as an outpatient, which patient has to be admitted, which patient need the ICU, which patient can be kept on the floor, 
and finally uh, uh, talk about the treatment available at this point. Um, so um, as my first slide, I'm gonna try to share the slides with you. Okay, if, uh, Talia, can you help me like moving on the slide, if you don't mind? So while I continue talking. Go ahead, I'm, uh, I'm oh, helping you. Now, now it's probably- working. I got you. Here, it's working now. Okay, so as you all know um, that COVID- uh, We're not seeing your screen, Amar, can you share your screen? Okay. Go back to the Zoom meeting here. Good, now we can see it. You can see it now. Okay, so let's see if that will work. Now, uh, COVID-19 stands for uh, coronavirus disease 2019, and it's basically caused by SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, which is a new virus. Uh, we're still, I'm sorry, we're still not seeing your screen for some reason. Okay. Probably I'm joining as audio only look like now. I send you the slide. Will you be able to share that? Because I'm joining as only audio now. Let me try again. Nathan, we're looking at your south southwest general screen if you have the slides. Is that is that the plan? Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're looking at your screen. Now we can okay, now we're good. Now it's working again. Okay. Okay, and uh, I was, uh, you know, mentioning about that the SARS, uh, the COVID-19 disease is caused by SARS-CoV-2, which is uh, a new virus on the corona class. As you all know, probably there is two major uh, endemics that happened before. And the first one was SARS uh, that in 2003. At that time, actually, I was still a resident, last year resident an internal medicine and made the presentation uh, in the grand rounds about SARS. But I made the presentation with never seen a case. Uh, now, uh, we all like the total number affected during that SARS epidemic uh, was only 8,000 patients and only about 774 died from that. You know? uh, it affected about 26 countries. Now, the second one happened from a similar virus was the MERS uh, the epidemic. And that mainly affected the Middle East. And at that time, it's affected uh, less numbers, but the mortality rate was much higher. So affected about 2,500 patients and the mortality uh, about 866 died. So one on a three died from that. So when it comes to mortality, maybe MERS was the most uh, deadly virus in this class of viruses as we know so far. Okay, moving next slide. Now, we all know that the travelers has spread the virus, starting from China and spreading that to Europe and then uh, to Europe, Iran, and then it spread also to the US. Uh, now, uh, uh, probably, probably restriction of travel and social distancing uh, is, is maybe the best measures that we took, I mean, to stop more spreading uh, uh, of the disease. Now, as per March 11, the WHO uh, declared uh, uh, the disease as a global pandemic. Do I go like the girl? 
Now, uh, I don't want to talk about the, the whole number. Probably you, you are familiar with numbers, and these numbers are changing every day. But I want to talk a little bit more about Michigan, uh, because uh, this is what I practice. Uh, uh, as per yesterday, the slide I took this from yesterday, and the probability is changing today. Uh, we have about 24,000 cases confirmed of COVID-19. And two. Uh, now, uh, when it comes to Mich Michigan, the majority of the cases actually happen in Detroit area and suburb of, of Detroit, where I practice. Um, I do also go to Lansing, but my majority of practice with the group I, I belong to, we practice in Detroit area and suburb of of Detroit. Now I can tell you uh, uh, the situation here is is really uh, you know miserable, and uh, we we are flooded. All hospitals are you know working above their capacity. Uh, I'm working in two different hospitals, and then uh, uh, I'm seeing tons of of uh, COVID patients. Now today I'm I'm actually on call for the for the VA, and I have about 15 patients on the ICU. Uh, our capacity in the ICU is only about eight patients, but we did open the step down as an ICU, and we took a double of that number. Now, we, the, uh, usually ICU and the VA is not that busy. We usually only had but few patients, but uh, this is maybe triple of our capacity uh, working here in the ICU. I work in a different hospital as well. Uh, the other hospital, uh, uh, we, we also have ICU beds, about 10 beds, but we also opened the step down. The step down was about 20 beds. So we have about 30 ICU beds, or all full with, with ICU patients. We are keeping ventilated patients on the, uh, uh, in the step down. And the step down nurses have to take care of these uh, patients. Uh, now, as you know, probably the ratio of a step down nurses to the, to the, to the patient care is, is you know, much higher compared to the ICU. So they, this is put extra load on them. Not only this, uh, their experience with treating the disease is also much less. So uh, having said that, also on the top of this, we are all completely uh, uh, full. On the top of this, we started to find for other hospitals to transfer this patient. And we have difficulty you know, finding a hospital to accept these patients. Now, uh, moving to next slide, when you talk about symptom and presentation, there is many things that probably will overlap with the ASR presentation. Uh, but I'm going to try to focus on, on, on you know, more of a clinical and practical points. Uh, uh, for if it goes uh, back to the slide before that, uh, yes. So these are the presenting symptoms of the uh, COVID-19 infection. Uh, and as you can tell, I put the bigger picture for patients who, uh, who have uh, uh, dyspnea. Uh, even it's not the most common presentation. We all, we all know that the most common presentation is fever, which can happen up to 90% of the cases, and cough. Now, some, some people try to, you know, uh, stratify the cough as only dry cough, uh, but I mean, it's hard for me to tell if there's anything specific when it comes to symptoms and presentation, as Yasser mentioned, that can be uh, diagnostic of COVID-19. Uh, we can tell is it more common to be a dry cough, but I mean, I have seen patients that had none of dry cough and they were turned to be positive for COVID. And we saw a lot of atypical presentation, including GI. I mean, you see diarrhea is one of the uh, uh, presentation for this infection. Uh, now, when, when I, why I want to uh, 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 outline the dyspnea uh, as the major symptoms here, even it only presents on 20 to 30 percent of cases, basically because dyspnea is very serious symptom. You know, when somebody have a dyspnea and has confirmed COVID or suspected COVID, this patient has to go to the, to the hospital because we know that dyspnea is more likely that the patient had hypoxia and had lung involvement and pneumonia and he need to be treated on in the hospital. These are actually one of the symptoms that probably had you know, the worst prognosis compared to the other symptoms in addition to the high, very high fever as well. Okay, we're gonna move to the next slide. Now, when it comes to diagnostic testing, we talked about that before, but all based actually, uh, um, I wanna go back a little bit and say here. Now, as we said before, there's no specific a symptom, no specific uh, uh, X-ray finding can tell you this is a COVID-19 infection. So what we need, we need to test and you need to detect the virus to confirm that the patient had COVID-19. Now, because presentation can be similar to influenza or other virus infection or other respiratory infections. So how do you uh, confirm the diagnosis? By detection, detection of the virus. And usually we do RT-PCR testing uh, to identify the, the virus RNA. 
Now, uh, what do you obtain the sample from? This is important. So the technique of the sample is very important because if you don't do it right, that can lead to a false negative. Uh, but also at the same time, if you do it from the nasal pharynx, uh, it's better outcome uh, compared to the, if you do it from the throat. And if you do it from the lower respiratory, uh, compared to the upper respiratory samples, also their uh, chance of being uh, uh, positive is higher compared to if you do it from the upper respiratory uh, side. Now, uh, as Yasser also mentioned before, the shedding of the virus, it can continue for a long time, up to 20 days. And actually this is more specific for elderly people and people who had severe illness, illness as well and people who had comorbid conditions. So these people can shed viruses up to 20 days. So when they come to me on the, on the ICU and they say, okay, like let's follow the criteria that they are set by CDC and WHO. If the patient had, for example, negative test times two or a patient symptoms had, uh, uh, has resolved over the last like three days, then let's take him off isolation. I would say no, you know, shedding of the virus, we can continue up to 20 days, especially on this sick patient. So we have to be very careful with that. Okay, we can move to the next slide, please. Now, when they talk about uh, risk stratification of the disorder or the disease, uh, 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 we, the major data come from uh, the cohort that we have, the Chinese cohort, uh, that study about 44,000 patients and give us a lot of insight and information about the illness, severity, and risk stratification. As we know, majority of patients are mild to moderate disease. 81% of these patients present with mild to moderate disease. And this patient can be treated at, at home, as we mentioned. And the treatment basically to isolate yourself uh, and, and, and have a symptomatic treatment. Now, 20% uh, or 19% that can present with severe or critical illness. Uh, when I talk about severe, what are the criteria? Because that's very important as a clinician to know how do you identify or how do you uh, qualify this patient for having a severe uh, disease. It's basically a patient who presents with dyspnea, as I mentioned before, the symptoms is very important. So having dyspnea alone, that make you, you know, uh, on the severe uh, range of this disease. Now having hypoxia or more than 50% uh, infiltrate on the x-ray, all of these can qualify you to be, I mean, uh, stratified as a severe illness and you have to be admitted to the hospital. Now a critical illness, a patient who presents with respiratory failure, mainly hypoxic, shock or multi-organ dysfunction. And these people usually represent about 5% of this uh, patient population. Go next slide, please. Uh, as we know, uh, what are the risk factors for severe illness? Actually, uh, two major factors. As we mentioned before, age is one, and the other one is comorbidities. When it comes to age, as we know, mortality can be as high as 15% on people older than 80 years old. Now, the mortality is less than 1% in patients who are less than 40 years old. And the same applies to comorbid conditions. As, as patients who doesn't have a comorbid conditions, their chance of dying of this is very low, less than 1%. You can go to the next slide, please. Compared to patients who does have a, a, a comorbid condition, their chance of dying from this is much higher. For example, if you had a patient who had cardiovascular disease, as a comorbid condition, the chance of dying of this more than 10%, and so on. If you had a hypertension, diabetes, chronic respiratory disorder, or even diabetes, all of these increase your risk of dying from the disease as well. Now, what are the risk factors for progression? So if a patient come to you, okay, and then you either like monitor the patient at home or you put them on the floor, but either way, I mean, you have to keep an eye on this patient. You never, okay, even the patient who had the mild disease, you never like tell the patient go home and then you forget about them. You have to continue following on this patient and you have to be sure that they have a monitoring uh, system for these patients as well, because these patients can deteriorate and they can deteriorate later on. So we have some cases actually deteriorate a week or 10 days later. So you have to keep on mind, okay, if the patient had symptoms, of confirmed or suspected case of COVID, we continue monitoring of, of these patients. Now, when I come to the hospital, when I put the patient on the floor, also like it, it's really scare me, like just to leave this patient on the floor sometimes not being monitored, especially when they start to show infiltrate or fever, because I know these patients are a higher risk of deterioration and, and they can really deteriorate within 24 hours, even less. I have cases that uh, I, I kept the patient on the floor and then within a few hours, they went from uh, room air to nasal cannula 
uh, to a narrow breather and then ended up in the ICU and being intubated within a few hours. So it can progress that quickly. So we have to be careful with that. Now the high fever, having infiltrate, uh, history of smoking, even smoking marijuana is very important. Telling your patient even occasional marijuana smoking and occasional nicotine smoking can increase risk of, of uh, uh, corona infection and increase risk of a progression into severe disease. So that's very important for people to quit smoking during this period of time to reduce the risk of having a quick progression. Um, and, and finally, there is a certain lab futures that I also can tell you these patients ha had a chance of progressing and they have a chance of, of uh, doing uh, badly uh, uh, on this disease. Uh, for example, I mean, if a patient had high ferritin, has, has a high D-dimer, and there's multiple other labs that we check, and they can tell you this patient a prognosis is going to be worse compared to others. Next slide, please. So what do you recommend when the patient comes to the hospital? What kind of testing you would obtain? Now, there is testing we obtain at, at admission, and there is testing can be done later on. And there is testing that you have to do uh, every few days, you know, especially tested that turn to be positive, you have to follow on these testing. So if you look on the column on the middle, actually, this is the one we uh, recommend on admission. And then you would have to repeat any test that come back as, as abnormal. So for example, if the patient ferritin coming back as abnormal and high, I would follow on that. If the patient D-dimer is coming back as high as one and abnormal, I will follow every two to three days. See where is the trend of this D-dimer ferritin and other abnormalities on the blood work. Now, uh, if you look at the first one, uh, the first column uh, presented to an orange color, uh, these are the one we do on a daily basis. So from day one and every day, and this including the CBC, and the complete metabolic panel, including liver function tests, which is also a prognostic factor, and the CBK. Now, there is some testing we do uh, uh, as indicated. For example, I mean, we talk about blood cultures. You know, I won't do a blood culture on this patient unless I suspect the patient had uh, bacterial uh, infection. Um, uh, now, uh, 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 procalcitonin. You know, procalcitonin usually, usually it's negative on these patients, but it can turn to be positive later on. So if you see the patient's severity of illness is getting worse, I would recommend you obtain procalcitonin, and it can be a prognostic factor for these patients. Now, one important thing I want to mention here as well uh, is, is AKG. Uh, like I would recommend obtaining AKG on this patient on a daily basis, especially patients who had a severe infection or patients who are on medication that may prolong their QT. So for these two disorder uh, or two abnormality, I'll obtain the daily AKG. Why we do daily EKG for people who had a severe infection? Because their chance of having coronary artery disease is higher and the chance of having heart failure as well is higher. Now for chest X-ray, it would recommend to obtain a daily chest X-ray, but the problem, as you know, these patients are in isolation and then you would like to reduce inter, uh, interaction with these patients and the blood work and, and a routine stop. Uh, so what I do and follow on my patient, I do it more on as needed basis. When I see that there's a change, from baseline and the clinical status, I go ahead and obtain uh, x-rays on this patient. Next slide, please. The lab findings, as we mentioned before, lymphopenia is the most common one, is a prognostic factor. There is other things that can happen as well, including elevated liver function tests, high CRP, high ferritin, high D-dimer. All of these are probably, you know, I may not have to go over this again, so we can move to the next slide. Now, chest X-ray uh, and CAT scan. Now, uh, chest X-ray typically is showed bilateral airspace disease and consolidation, but this is non-specific. Okay, it can happen with other disorder, as we know. Now, what about the CAT scan? The CAT scan, also as we mentioned before, it's not easy to obtain CAT scan on these patients. So, I would like not to do CAT scan unless we really have indication for doing this, because it may not add any additional information for you. Now, some people describe about these symmetric infiltrate on the periphery and having grounded glass as typical of COVID. Yes, a lot of patients present this way, but you can have a typical presentation when it comes to chest X-ray and a CAT scan as well. Next slide, please. Now, mechanism of hypoxia, I don't know if, uh, uh, if any of other presenters will be, I mean, like uh, pointing toward this, but this is very important because I wanna mention this is not ER ERDS. You know, some stages of the disease can be ARDS, but I mean, it's not like just a plain ARDS as we initially thought. 
So what I want to say is that some of the mechanism doesn't go along with ARDS, including the vasodilatation because of the cytokines that goes up on this uh, viral infection. So uh, that the sometimes we, it, it will be so, uh, uh, so high that they can lead to what called the cytokine storm. But the cytokines in general lead to vasodilatation instead of vasoconstriction. As we all know with hypoxia, that you do vasoconstriction, try to uh, uh, improve oxygenation. But in reality, what happened here is the opposite vasodilatation, that leads to shunting. So shunting is a major problem. That's why you see this patient, in spite sometimes uh, they don't have major abnormality on x-rays on a CAT scan, they're still very hypoxic. Why? Because of the shunting, one of the major mechanisms. And the other mechanism that we mentioned before is the microthrombosis and vessel occlusion. It's like a small PEs that occluding the distal uh, uh, pulmonary arteries and leading to also like shunting and VQ mismatching as well. Now, other patients they present like, uh, 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 like other ARDS patients, including when you see this inflammatory exudate and like a fluid inside the alveoli and al uh, alveolar collapse and atelectasis, especially on, on the gravity areas, like on, on the back when the patient is lay, laying on their back, you see it more on the posterior lung field. So uh, yes, especially on advanced disease, you see what is similar to ARDS. Next slide. I like this slide a lot because, I mean, it differentiates two different phenotypes of patients. Uh, one, one phenotype, we call it like L phenotype, which stands for low on everything. And the other one's called the H phenotype, which stands for high on everything. What it, is the L phenotype? Basically, they had a low elasticity, which is a high compliance. And they had a low VQ because of the high perfusion. As you know, the perfusion is the Q. And if you had, uh, the Q is, is being high, then the whole ratio goes down. So the low uh, uh, VQ and, and low lung weight, because these patients usually are dry, don't have much infiltrate, don't have much of, of fluid inside their lung or leak into the alveoli. And they usually these patients are treated on the ventilator with the low peak. Compared to the edge, the edge is more like ERDS-like picture. As we know, they have a low compliance, high elasticity. They had a high VQ mismatching with low perfusion. They have high lung weight because of the exudate inflammation that goes into the alveoli and the fluid leak, and they require usually high PEEP. Now there's a confusion probably, I think Abdul Ghani will, will, uh, will point into uh, ventilator management of this patient, but I mean, there are some people they say, okay, well, let's give a low PEEP. Some other people recommend the high PEEP. So people are getting uh, confused about what do we use here. And having phenotyping of the patient here, when patient come to me as, you know, x-ray is not very bad, not whiting out, and the patient doesn't look like on, on, on the ventilator that they have a problem with the compliance. Uh, and this patient probably I'll put them on the lower peak, especially at the beginning of the disease. Compared to later on, when see more infiltrate, I see low, uh, less of compliance, uh, I see more of a stiff lung, this patient require a higher peak, and I will treat him like as, a treat, as I treat ARDS. Next slide, please. Now, when it comes to clinical management and treatment, as you know, when it comes to mild to moderate disease, stay home and do symptomatic supportive treatment, but don't forget this patient. And please be sure that you follow on this patient all the time. Be sure they don't deteriorate and you tell them, give them instruction, you know, in case you had a very high fever or in case you had dyspnea at any time, then you, you call and, and you have to be admitted for these symptoms. In, in case like this patient is not improving over a long period of time, then you have to keep an eye on these patients as well. Next slide. Now, when uh, you have a severe disease, these patients require hospitalization for management, okay? And then when you manage this patient, actually there is no specific treatment. It's currently FDA approved. So all management that we do, and even when we talk about, I mean, like a certain drugs that we use on this, is not FDA approved. And we're gonna talk a little bit more details about that in the, in the coming slide. Now, so how do you treat this patient? It's supportive care as well. Now, you also treat the complication that you can expect that may happen from that disease. What are the complications? Mainly pneumonia. You can end with hypoxic respiratory failure, ARDS. You can also end up with sepsis and septic shock and cardiomyopathy and arrhythmias. Acute kidney injury is very common in these patients as well. And complication from prolonged hospitalization that can include secondary infection, PE, GI bleed, and so on. Next one, please. Now oxygenation, what, how do you oxygenate this patient? It's all depending on, you know, severity of the illness. For patients who are like 
have a mild disease, they probably they don't need oxygen. They maintain their oxygenation okay. Now for a patient who had a moderate to severe, then they require oxygen. And all what you need to do, apply oxygen that keep their saturation between 92 to 96%. Now uh, uh, you go up on the oxygen as the patient getting worse. For example, you go from nasal cannula to Ventimax, nano breather and high flow oxygen. Now, when it comes to high flow oxygen and use of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation in general, uh, uh, these are helpful. Yes, we know, especially when it comes to non-COVID patient, but the concern here is two things. First, I mean exposure. So these are open systems and you can, uh, with aerosolization of, of the air, then you can infect the healthcare provider that taking care of this patient. So this is a major risk. And the other risk also, now this patient, the, the course of disease is not like other simple like hypoxia from regular pneumonia that usually result within a few days. These patients get sick for a long time. So when they end up, I mean, being sick or, or when they end up on being on BiBAB or ventilator, they usually get sick for weeks. You're talking about two to three weeks. And we know these patients don't come off the ventilator that easily and they fail very often as well. So I, I mean, giving like uh, a BiBAB to patient who is, um, uh, giving BiBAB to patient who I know is not going to be able to come up BiBAB in a day or two, I don't think is useful. I'm just exposing the healthcare provider to increase risk of getting the infection. I'm not helping my patient. So I usually go from high flow oxygen or even not a breather directly into intubation. Now also the same apply when you do a nebulized and aerosolized medication. So we usually, in our policies at the hospital I work at, we, we, we are uh, canceling nebulized and aerosolized medication for this patient. We're only using the metadosis uh, inhalers, MDIs, uh, when the patient end up on the ventilator uh, because a risk of exposure to healthcare workers. And uh, intubation and mechanical ventilation, probably uh, Abdelhan is going to talk about that in more details later on. Next slide, please. And I also like this slide, even it's empty here, but uh, uh, also it's confusing here. I mean, like to, to come, some people talk about, okay, give him too much of fluid. Some other people say, no, dry him out. A fluid can hurt these patients. And, and what is the agreement now? I think the agreement to have a balance between the two, because we know these patients, when they come to us, they are dry actually. And they have acute kidney injury because of dehydration mainly at the beginning. Uh, why they have a high fever, okay, they are losing uh, uh, water, you know, that way. And also a lot of time they have diarrhea, which is another water loss, and they are not eating well for, for a while. They usually sick average about five to seven days before, before they come to us. So if you come this patient to you, and then the first day you diaries this patient, you're taking the risk of hitting the kidneys very hard, and you end up with acute renal failure. Now, do you give them too much fluid? I would say no also, because I would, if they give them too much fluid and they end up with ERDS like picture soon, then probably I will have a problem with oxygenating this patient. So having a balance between the two is the answer for this question. Next slide, please, Hazen. Now, this is also another uh, uh, point of uh, uh, controversial uh, uh, version. Uh, when, when do you use a steroid on these patients? Now, I, I brought here uh, uh, the CDS and the WHO recommendation and the SCCM recommendation for use of steroid. Because also I have a lot of discussion, uh, hot discussion with my uh, group and other uh, uh, colleagues about use of steroid on these patients. I mean, uh, the CDC and the WHO uh, recommendation not to use it, okay? Unless the patient had other indication for using of this steroid. Like example, if the patient had asthma exacerbation or COBD exacerbation or they have like severe septic shock. Now uh, for the SS, SCCM, they recommend to use it, but that recommendation is very weak. Uh, it's in favor of the use of steroid only on patients who had a very severe hypoxia with ARDS and their PF ratio is less than 100. And why? Because I mean, to, to me, there's no evidence, first of all. And the second, we know our experience with use of steroid and ARDS, even we use it for decades, and we ended up like having, uh, we, we ended up stopping using of steroid because we know steroid that does not work in the RDS, except in the specific cases, case by case. And, and if it does work and lead to a lot of side effects, even acute when it comes to hyperglycemia and myopathy, and especially hyperglycemia, which can worsen mortality and worsen outcomes and can overcome the benefit that comes from the use of steroid. Next slide. Now, managing chronic medication, this is also a lot of points are coming up on the media and other places. What do you do with these medications? That the patient, do we use NSAIDs or Tylenol? Do we use ACE inhibitor or ARP? 
do we use the statins on these patients? And why these are confusing points? Because there are some concerns, but the concerns all coming from also anecdotal uh, uh, reports that uh, an individual experience that happened. For example, I mean, for the NSAID, they came from study, small study uh, 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 occurred on, on a small population of young COVID patients. When they were giving NSAID to get their temperature down, they ended up with the worsening of their underlying respiratory disorder. Now, uh, there is no uh, control. We, we, we don't know all of these are anecdotal experience, uh, observation study that uh, does not confirm that NSAIDs really hurt uh, or worsen the outcomes on these patients. But having said that, I would say, don't use it if you don't have to. Like uh, we know this patient, okay, you can get their temperature down by cooling, by using Tylenol. Now, also we know that they have comor comorbid conditions, especially acute kidney injury, and using NSAIDs on these patients, especially in a high dose for a longer period of time, they can worsen their kidney outcomes. So I would be uh, not using this medication unless, unless I have to. The same applies to ACE inhibitor. You know, we know the kidney disorder that happened with this disorder as well, so I won't use ACE inhibitor unless the patient is, is already on ACE inhibitor and the kidneys are doing okay. Now, ARBs, they said there's maybe a good benefit from ARB. So if you can switch ACE inhibitor to ARB this, on these patients, it probably would be helpful. A statin, why we don't use a statin on these patients? Now, there, there's a concern about statin can lay, raise the uh, transaminases. Now, uh, if the patient already on a statin, you know, uh, it's unlikely that will happen on the day the patient gets sick with the coronavirus. So I'll, if the patient was already on a statin, I won't stop it. But if the patient is not on a statin, I won't start it at the hospital. So these are my recommendations when you come to managing this chronic medication. Next one. Now, when it comes to specific treatment, and these are the last two slides I'm going to mention here. So the optimal up approach to treatment is uncertain. Okay, there's no therapies that has clearly proven to be effective. There's no treatment that is FDA approved. Okay, and, and for most of these tra treatment, they are coming from observational studies. Now, having said that, there is ongoing studies uh, that happening day and night. Like, I just look at the uh, uh, trial.gov government uh, uh, trial uh, research site yesterday. And I found that there is ongoing 440 registered trials just specific for COVID infection are ongoing now. And there's a lot actually of journals that they are accepting, uh, you know, a fast review, what they call emergent review of these articles. And even like, you know, they're announcing the results of the, the initial studies before they publishing uh, uh, these studies. So, but having said that, you have, we have to be really careful, okay, not to uh, uh, be rushed into taking or judging these studies. We have to really, each study has a flows and we have to be careful with that. So we have to look for good evidence before we can really say this is, will work for this disease. Next one. And this is the last slide, uh, which, I mean, you probably will predict I'm gonna talk too much about this specific treatment, but to be honest with you, I can go into studies, but all of these studies are a small number of patients. They are all either observational, retrospective, or like anecdotal, anecdotal reports. So I don't see a benefit of doing this. I say these are the options that are available for you now. Now, all of these are off-label, not FDA approved. We're still waiting for evidence to come and, and look for evidence every day. So keep with the media, keep with the journals that you are reading, uh, keep yourself updated because every day there is a new studies are coming out about use of these treatment. Now, when it comes to my experience, you know, I work, as I said, in two hospitals, including the VA and another big hospital. And uh, both of these hospitals are full of these patients and they have a policies. And, and all of these, the two hospitals I work with are using hydroxychloroquine, for example. They are using Azithromax. They are using the zinc. You know, this all, all off-label. And then what comes, these are, you know, VA hospital. Usually you predict they will wait for more data. It's a university hospital before they start this treatment. But uh, the, unfortunately, we don't have too much options for these patients. And they are dying in the front of eyes. So when it comes to severe illness, especially when the patient end up being on the ICU, severely hypoxic, or end up on the ventilator, we are going ahead and using whatever is available because we know the mortality rate for these patients is very high. It can reach up to 80%, unfortunately. So I'm done with my presentation. I'll be open for any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Ammar. Very nice and informative presentation. Uh, I have a question for you about using negative pressure rooms, which we don't have a lot of it. I've seen the hospital right now using some devices in these rooms. 
to create some kind of negative pressure and suctioning of all the air in the room. What do you guys do in your hospital? So you have to remember, this is not airborne. This is droplet transfer mm -hmm. disease. So, I mean, having the patient on positive pressure uh, rooms is okay, unless you're doing any aerosolized uh, procedure. For example, if you're doing bronchoscopy or using BiPAP on these patients. Uh, though, so these, I mean, specific patients, I would like save their negative pressure rooms for these patients. Because we know availability is very short. I mean, I know majority of the hospital only have about a couple of beds, maybe another couple on the ICU. So availability of these beds and rooms are, are very short. So try to save these patients, these rooms for patients that they benefit from it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ammar. Now we move to uh, Dr. Abdul Ghani Hamadi. Okay, I'm going to uh, put my slides up and hopefully it will be shared. Can you see it? Not yet. Um, hmm. I have share a screen. Maybe you need to click it twice. Okay. Okay, do you see it? Mm, not yet. Hmm. Okay. Um, do you see them? No, Mazen. Ah, oh, now we can see them. Now, oh. now we're good. Okay. All right. Um, so first of all, uh, again, thank you, uh, Ohio Chapter, for uh, inviting us uh, and for this. Uh, uh, session and for this webinar and thank you all the organizers. Uh, my job is to give you a little crash course on mechanical ventilation and um, so we'll talk about mechanical ventilation in general then a little bit about mechanical ventilation in ARDS and then um, a few slides about uh, COVID specifically for COVID patients and then we'll touch maybe a couple of slides about non-invasive. I know I'm Mar talked about it, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. So um, principles of mechanical ventilation, um, we have, what are the modes of mechanical ventilation? Basically, there are three major uh, modes. One is called assist control, pressure support, and SIMV. Um, SIMV, or synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation, is probably used now mainly by surgeons and anesthesiologists. Um, I don't think any pulmonologists use it anymore, but we'll, we'll just talk about it just briefly. Assist control is two types, volume control and pressure control. Volume control is uh, setting up the ventilator and you basically tell the ventilator that you need to give that patient a set volume, let's say 400 mLs. So the ventilator will push volume into that person, into that patient, until it reaches that volume, regardless of the pressure. So the pressure is not steady. It could be up and down, depending on the compliance, um, and depending on, uh, and it may vary from a breath to a breath, because the compliance may change. In order for the ventilator to give that volume, the patient has to trigger the breath. And that trigger, as you can see here, could be a very small negative uh, pressure. And you can set that. Usually it's around minus two. Remember, um, any positive pressure is not physiologic. We breathe uh, in a negative pressure. The diaphragm contracts and generates negative pressure and that's how air inhaled, is inhaled. Um, so all what we do in ventilator management is not physiologic, it, actually. It's a positive pressure. So when the patient triggers the ventilator, every time they trigger it, the volume is pushed. And then you can also set how fast you want that volume to be pushed in. And that's called the inspiratory phase, and here's the expiratory phase. And you can make this faster or slower. So if you make it faster, then you allow more time for expiration. And we usually do that for patients, for example, who have asthma or COPD, where you have impaired expiratory uh, uh, phase. So you need longer time for expiration. 
uh, versus if someone has a stiff lung, you may want to do this uh, more slow, give them more time during inspiration so you can inflate the lung more. And we can talk about that more. But for, the, for, the, for practical purpose, all you need is a volume, tidal volume, and usually the I to E ratio or the inspiratory phase is set by the ventilator. You, know, you don't usually need to set that. You also need to set the FiO2, which you usually start with 100% and then we wean down. And the PEEP normally for normal people with no ARDS is around between five and eight. And some people claim that five is more physiologic. Now, pressure control is the opposite. If someone has stiff lung, if a patient has stiff lungs, you say, you, I want to give this patient 500 mLs, but the lungs are stiff and you're pushing air in there. What happens like a balloon, when you push a lot of air and it's overinflated, it may pop. So the airway pressure will be elevated. So in severe cases of ARDS where you have decreased compliance and very stiff lungs, and you have a problem with airway pressure, then you tell the ventilator, okay, just push air until you reach a certain pressure. So once you reach that certain pressure, you stop. Now, the problem with that is you don't know what the volume is. The volume may change from a breath to a breath because the pressure may change depending on the compliance from a breath to a breath. So uh, the problem with this may end up being under ventilating the patient because the total volume may be very small. So you end up with high PCO2. However, even if you have high PCO2, what normally happens is the kidneys compensate and the bicarb starts climbing. So as long as the pH is uh, close to normal, we call this permissive hypercapnia. So in, in certain patients who have severe ARDS, we go to pressure control, and if the PCO2 goes up, you tolerate that as long as the pH is reasonable, and you call that permissive hypercapnia. So the volume is variable, but the pressure is preset. Okay, I'm, I'm skipping some details because you really don't need to get into that. So here's the volume control. Here's pressure control. Pressure is set. With a volume control, it, it peaks and it goes down. Pressure control, you keep it the same. Here's your inspiration, here's your expiration. Now, um, one other way to keep the lungs inflated, and that's what we call uh, recruitable maneuvers to recruit alveoli, is to make the inspiratory phase longer. So the I to E ratio, and I think we, we can, we'll, there's another slide about it, is higher. So you inflate the lung longer time, and then you recruit more alveoli. Pressure regulated volume, a lot of, uh, that's what we call PRVC, is basically a smart volume control, where the ventilator will also have a pressure regulation. It will not allow to pressure to go up to any higher than a certain level. Um, what about SIMV? SIMV is synchronized. So remember with volume control, every time the patient triggers the ventilator, he or she will get the total volume that you set. So if the, if the patient is breathing 30 times a, a, a minute, then they will get 30 times 500. In SIMV, you put a rate of, let's say 10 or 12. The rest of the breathing is spontaneous, meaning the patient will not get that tidal volume. They will get their own tidal volume. And a lot of times, because this is small, you add pressure support to this, and we'll talk about pressure support, and therefore the tidal volume is not as small. So if patient, let's say, is breathing 30 with SIMV, that means they're getting 12 times 500, which is what you set, plus eight, or we, if it's, uh, or um, no, not eight. Uh, if it's 20, then it's eight times 200, for example. So it will not be a, uh, in other words, you do not know exactly what the minute ventilation. 
because you don't control it because the patient has spontaneous breathing. And it's synchronized because if the patient triggers, the ventilator is not gonna trigger at the same time. So it synchronizes. Now this was a common and popular mode for pulmonologists in the past, especially for weaning. Uh, because you, we thought we can decrease the rate gradually from go from 10 to 12, from 12 to 10 to eight and six and then, but that in multiple studies, we found out that all, this only prolongs weaning and it doesn't help and the outcome is not as good. So nobody st uses this mode in weaning anymore. We use spontaneous breathing trial as we will see. Uh, but you will probably see this mode in uh, surgical ICUs. And uh, I don't know, for some reason, anesthesiologist and surgeons still use that mode. But we, we rarely use it. So the initial setting, you, you're in the ICU, you intubated someone, what do you put them on? What, what do you start with? Start up with 100% and then titrate down. Rate is usually, usually 12. I to E ratio, usually one to two to three. That's normally your expiration takes longer than your inspiration. PEEP of five and total volume is six to eight mLs per kilogram, ideal body weight. Now, um, this total volume, obviously, as we will see later, should be lower in people with ARDS who have stiff lungs. Because, why? Because we found out from several studies that when you have a, a larger volume, there is uh, lung injury, acute lung injury, secondary to either high pressure or to high volume. And this was proven by biopsies of patients who were on the ventilator. So it is very important to keep that volume um, within this range and even lower in people who have low compliance. So troubleshooting. So you're in the ICU, you're managing the patient, they will call you and say, Either the, patient, the ventilator is uh, alarming or the patient is cyanotic or there's asymmetrical movement of the lungs um, or patient drop their blood pressure. Now they're in shock. What do you do? How do, how do you troubleshoot that? So the main problems, the main issues, if you, if you look into three issues or three categories, then you probably covered 90% of the problems. Either high airway pressure or hypoxemia or hypotension, okay? So, high airway pressure. So how does that manifest? The, usually the, alarm, the ventilator starts alarming. There's high pressure. So there are two types of pressures and I think most of you are familiar with that. There's peak airway pressure and plateau airway pressure. The peak airway pressure, and, and they could be the same or different. So how do you determine whether the ventilator is alarming because of a high peak or high plateau? Very simple, when the, on the ventilator, when the patient reaches this point, there is a pause button. So inspiratory pause. And once you hit that for about maybe five seconds or 10 seconds, you reach that plateau because that will allow the pressure to equalize throughout the airways. And then you reach what we call plateau pressure. This plateau pressure reflects the dynamic or the, the compliance of the lung. This peak airway pressure reflects the airways. So first thing you do is you walk to the ventilator and you, um, hit that pause button. And then you figure out, is it peak or is it plateau? So if it's peak, that means you're dealing with airway problem. And that airway could be anywhere from the ventilator, uh, if, the, uh, if the tube is kinked or patient uh, developed uh, mucus plugs or developed acute bronchospasm, all of that will lead to narrowing of the airways and high pressure, peak pressure will be high. However, the uh, plateau pressure will be normal. So what do you do? So if you, if you um, determine that the patient has high peak airway pressure and not plateau pressure, 
Then the first thing you do is disconnect, make sure everything in the tubing is clear. And then you suction the patient, make sure there's no mucus plug. And if you hear wheezing, for example, you start getting bronchodilators and that's how you deal with that problem. Um, Okay, so what if it is a uh, plateau pressure that is high? So suddenly your lungs become stiff. Now, why is that? Well, either because patient developed pulmonary edema or they develop a pneumothorax that limited the lungs from expanding or there's dyssynchrony with a, with a muscle spasm, um, pneumothorax, a pleural effusion, but the, that usually takes time to develop. So how do you know all of that? Well, you get a chest x-ray and you find that. So this is how you deal with airway pressure and uh, ventilator alarming, generally. Patient became hypoxic. Suddenly, O2 sat went down. Okay, so how did that happen? Either the tube slipped into maybe the right main bronchus, accidental extubation, Patient developed pneumothorax, PE is a, a, a major issue. Increased intrapulmonary shunting, like for example, pulmonary edema, um, and ventilator malfunction is uh, not common. So how do we deal with that? We increase the pressure immediately. I mean, before we even know, go up to 100% or disconnect and start bagging, uh, you get a, uh, if the chest is not moving, you suspect pneumothorax, you immediately get a chest x-ray and you will solve, uh, you will figure out the problem most of the time, unless everything else is okay, then you get a CTA of the chest, make sure there's no PE. Okay, hypotension. Suddenly, uh, patient became hypotensive. And that is a very common uh, board question for those to taking board, patient on the ventilator suddenly became hypotensive. And that's their favorite. And their favorite is there's auto pee. So remember, we talked about ventilator being positive pressure, which is not physiologic. So positive pressure means you increase the intrathoracic pressure, which in, in turn decreases the cardiac output. So once you intubate the patient, and, and, and it happens very uh, commonly after you intubate, intubate the patient immediately. Patient is um, tachypneic, their adrenaline is high, you sedate them, you, you paralyze them, you intubate them, you put them on a positive pressure, suddenly they're pressured down. Tanks. They need fluid. You need to fill up the tank. So most of the time it responds to IV fluids. However, and then you also need to look at the sedation, started propofol, started fentanyl, suddenly their blood pressure down. Uh, you need to know what you're giving and make sure it doesn't have a uh, myocardial depressant effect. And the third cause would be air trapping or auto peep. So what is auto peep? Again, remember, this is inspiration, expiration, and put it bluntly, you empty your lung here, pressure is zero. Now, if you get another breath before you have time to empty your lung, what happens? The lung accumulates, the air accumulates in the lung, and it goes on and on until you develop auto peep or what we call breath stacking. And that hap this happens also if you, if you ventilate someone, let's say asthma or COPD, and they really need a long time during expiration. And because they have hypercapnia, you are zealous, you want to ventilate them, you give them a high rate. Let's say a rate of 20 or 30. What you're actually doing is causing auto peep because you're not allowing them to empty their lung, put it simply. So if that happens, and if, you, if, someone call, if they call you in the middle of the night, the blood pressure goes down, you give them IV fluid, still the blood pressure is down, what is the best strategy? Disconnect the patient from the ventilator. Let them do their expiration and then put them back on the ventilator with a lower rate. However, if they are actually tachypneic and they're doing their own rate, which is likely the case, what is the solution? You sedate the patient. And if you need to, you even paralyze them and take over because this can be 
catastrophic hemodynamically. Okay? Now, so that's just a general crash course on ventilators, different modes, and troubleshooting. I know I went very fast, but uh, again, you don't need a lot of details. Um, what about ARDS? ARDS, Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome, has its own challenges regarding ventilating patients. And just a quick word, ARDS is acute, diffuse, inflammatory lung injury. Um, and there's been so many definitions, so many papers about it, we really don't need, we don't have time to get into it. This is just a quick uh, reminder. And this is another reminder of the definition and how it is categorized. It's basically a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema and it's categorized by mild, moderate, severe, depending on your PF ratio, a PF ratio, how much FiO2, and what, uh, um, uh, and, and that's how you define it, uh, classify it. Okay, causes, again, pneumonia, aspiration, sepsis. These are your main causes. Other causes are um, uh, less common. Remember, pneumonia, sepsis, and aspiration. And here's a chest x-ray of how it looks. Uh, basically pulmonary edema, but the key here that you know it's not pulmonary edema, there's no cardiomegaly, there's no pleural effusion. If this, would be, if this was a, a cardiogenic pulmonary edema, you would expect pleural effusions and cardiomegaly. So that is your clue here, just looking at the chest x-ray. And that's how the CAT scan looked like. Diffuse inflammatory response, diffuse edema, uh, alveoli are full with fluid. That's why you develop the severe hypoxemia. And then again, as I mentioned, there are multiple uh, trials, multiple um, recommendations, but here's the ARDS network studies that show uh, we need to look into lower tidal volumes, six to eight, and actually now we're looking into lower than that, five, even four to five. Um, Amar talked about steroids. Steroids is a long story. Yes, no, yes, no, but there are some roles, but it's very limited. Prone position does help and it reduces mortality and it improves oxygenation. And the reason for that, because you, of, you recruit the alveoli. More alveolar recruitment, which is different than what we're going to talk about with COVID patients. Now, uh, neuromuscular blocking agents, uh, are important, especially when you have very stiff lungs and high, higher airway pressure. But by itself, it also should improve the outcome, even independent from decreasing the airway pressure. Now, if everything fails, let's say you have extremely uh, stiff lungs, you, get, you put them on pressure control, um, low tidal volume, you cannot ventilate these patients because when you have low tidal volume, remember, they develop hypercapnia, especially if they be develop barotrauma. Now you have chest tubes uh, that with large airway, with a large air leak. You cannot even ventilate these patients uh, or oxygenate them. Then we resort to extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO. Um, and there are many studies about ECMO it with different results. Basically, ECMO buys time until the lungs heal. And uh, you bypass, basically you bypass the lung, you oxygenate the blood and you put it back into the right system. Um, unless they have right heart failure, then you put it in the pulmonary arteries. Um, and these are the recommendations or criteria for using the ECMO. Again, we're, we don't need to get into details, you can read it. Okay. How about COVID patients? How do we ventilate the, uh, put them on a ventilator? Uh, again, I don't wanna repeat this. Uh, Ammar mentioned it, but you have, uh, we have described phenotype L, phenotype H, where everything is low here, everything is high here. And the ventilator management for both can be different because these patients, you ventilate them as ARDS. So high PEEP, higher recruitability, so that's where pronin works here. And um, you, you do have shunt, but shunt here 
plays a, a larger role with phenotype L. And um, so how do you know? Uh, patients with uh, type L have more shunting rather than uh, stiff lungs. And how do you know shunting? We know from physiology, if you give someone 100% FiO2, their, ox their oxygen saturation in a normal individual should be 100%. So shunting is, one, is the only cause of hypoxemia that does not respond to 100% oxygen. They're still hypoxic. So if they respond, then they have a mild disease. If they don't respond, then they're moderate to severe and they may look into now ARDS type. Um, and that's basically what, and, and then of course, when you have type H, then you're talking about very low compliance. When you have type L, then you have a good compliance. So, um, just a couple of words. So when you initially start, practically, when you initially intubate the patient and put them on a ventilator, and I don't have a slide for that, you start out with this strategy. You start out with uh, tidal volume six to eight, FIO2, and not very high PEEP, only PEEP of eight. And then if they don't, and then if they become hypoxic, then you start proning them. If they respond to proning, then you continue your strategy. However, if they become still more hypoxic and they do not respond, then you shift to the other strategy and you start going up on the PEEP, not to exceed 16. They have not responded to PEEP more than 16. And you still can do proning. Proning is recommended uh, up to 12 hours uh, a day, if possible, of course. And you start your recruitment maneuvers, which include your high PEEP, proning, and then there's another mode of ventilator called APRV, which is a little bit more sophisticated. So um, this is, as far as we know, how we deal with these patients with COVID. Now remember, these patients require probably some maneuvers with a ventilator. So practically, what you have to do is keep that, and I, I, I know those of you who work in the ICU have seen this, this is the monitor of the ventilator. And you can change, it's outside of the room. You have this cable. And in order to minimize uh, uh, the exposure of healthcare workers and respiratory therapists, you put it outside as well as oral IV poles now are outside. So you minimize your entrance and exit into the room. Okay. Now, just a, a couple of words about weeding. Let's say someone, uh, you put them on a ventilator, now it's time to wean. How do you decide that and when? There's a whole criteria. Uh, the, uh, I'm not gonna go through the details of it. I'm just gonna tell you that first of all, before you start weaning, you need to make sure that the cause of respiratory failure has improved and reversed before you even think about weaning. Then there's uh, objective criteria, subjective criteria like the respiratory rate, the RSBI, the NIF, all of these are numbers that by itself doesn't mean much. It's just, you have to put it in the clinical perspective uh, and uh, decide whether the patient is weanable or not. So again, in the past, they used SIMV pressure support, but that's no longer. We use the spontaneous breathing trial, let the patient breathe on their own. TP is a little bit harder because the tube has resistance, remember. Um, Patients who are breathing through an ET tube is like you're breathing through a straw. There's increased resistance. It's harder to breathe. So to overcome that, you put them on pressure support. And how much pressure support to overcome the resistance of the tube? Usually between five and 10 and, or eight. The ventilator can even calculate this and just automatically give pressure support to, over, to compensate for that uh, resistance. So how long do you keep them on? No more than two hours. I've seen people on it for hours and then suddenly they get, oh, they failed. Well, they failed because they are get tired. You do not place someone on spontaneous breathing trial with a tube in their throat more than two hours. If they pass that, that means they're most likely able to breathe on their own. And then you proceed with possible extubation. Of course, you do a blood gas. 
you make sure they're not hypoxic. And I should say also, you don't start weaning before uh, with a patient with a PEEP of 10, for example, or 15. Yeah, they have to be less than six, FIA2 less than 40%. That's all listed in the criteria. Um, now, after they breathe on their own, and here's what I mentioned about 35, they are, have to be hemodynamically stable, FIA2, blood pressure, heart rate, etc. So if you decide someone is spontaneously breathing and they're successful, that means you can extubate. Not necessarily. You have to make sure they protect their airways. So extubation criteria is different. They have to have a good cough and gag reflux to make sure they can protect their airways and then you can extubate. All right, so here's a summary. Um, uh, again, I, I hate to read slides, you can read it. Um, again, the, the initial mode is always assist control, volume or pressure control, usually volume. 90%, more than 90% is volume control. Um, pay attention to problems. The main three issues are hypotension, airway pressure, and hypoxemia. Um, again, oh, I mentioned this. The ET tube removal should be only after you made sure that the patient um, is able to protect their airways. There have also been reports that COVID patients uh, that got extubated developed strider afterwards. So it is recommended that you perform what we call a air leak test. Remember if someone has an ET tube in their trachea, uh, there's a space between the trachea and ET tube. However, if the trachea is smaller, when you deflate the cuff, there is no air leak. So you need to make sure, and, and we do that in people who have, let's say, angioedema. So if you deflate the cuff and you hear air leaking, that means there is adequate space between the endotracheal tube and the trachea, and there's no airway edema and will be safe to extubate. Okay, spontaneous breathing trial, 30 to 120 minutes. Monitor the patient during that and then extubate if successful. All right, non-invasive, uh, I know Ammar talked about that, but here's a criteria when you need to use it. We know it's a uh, highly aerosolized uh, procedure, so uh, you need to uh, be in a negative pressure room if possible. Otherwise, make sure you use your gear. And uh, the key is, if you wanna try someone on high flow or CPAP, not to put them on it and forget them because they can deteriorate very rapidly. You have to very closely monitor them. There's one more way of ventilating patients with high flow, which is called the helmet. I don't know if you've seen it, but this is, there's a series from University of Chicago, a very small study and, some, and we actually ordered these. You can connect this helmet to a CPAP or high flow. And the nice thing about it, you can increase the PEEP. Uh, so this way you can do non-invasive ventilation without aerosolizing, uh, without causing the aerosolizing. And that is in a nutshell, my presentation. I know I went quick, but uh, we don't have much time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abdelghani, for this nice presentation. It took me more than 20 years back to my residency with the numbers and all that stuff. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll open it up for questions and uh, discussion. And I know uh, Yasser been answering most of the questions. So I would go to Yasser. Of all the questions that you answer, would you see anything that would be beneficial for the rest of the group? Yasser? Okay. okay, sorry, I was double, I was double muted. Uh, it's kind of been a grab bag of, of questions. I think, you know, inevitably we're going to talk about experimental therapies. And, and I know we've talked about this before, but I'm going to bring this up again. So, you know, even, even though most systems are looking at Plaquenil, uh, it's been our policy to at least document that we've discussed the, the, the fact that there are established risks for the drug. 
and that un there's unclear benefit that the truly is equipoise with the patient before uh, using the medication. Now, thanks to the amount of media coverage it's had, you know, we've not seen somebody say no thanks. Um, they're willing to give it a shot, and that's fine. But I think that in terms of doing things that are medical legally defensible, if you give a patient plaquenil, uh, I think that's the best medical defensible. They're not using plaquenil, and we're not entirely sure that it works. And I think that you have to realize that in critical care, particularly, we have, you know, the paradigm has shifted. We used to be less evidence-based, and now the majority of our evidence-based approach, you know, all the things we do for ARDS, sepsis, it's primarily minimizing intervention, right? All the therapies for ARDS are protective because we're doing less to the patient. And so realizing our limitations and realizing that less is more has gone a long way in reducing mortality in the ICU. So I would apply the same principles here. So I think there's equipoise. We don't really know if these things are necessarily beneficial, there's reason to think that there might be, as long as we're being clear about how we document them, you know, the documentation of the discussion, I think, again, I think that's more defensible than just using it and, and hoping that it's going to be okay. I absolutely agree with um, you, sir. I absolutely agree with you. I want to add, when you mentioned about, like, do no harm, you know, because when you talk about the ArtsNet trial that was published, like, 20 years ago, and at that time, what did it show? It did show that, you know, we were doing harm to the patient by giving them large tidal volume. Now, we did not do intervention that was positive. We just let me remove the harm we were doing to the patient. We give him that what's supposed to be given, and then we reduce mortality by, you know, 10%, at least absolute risk uh, reduction was 10%. And send, apply now to the current situation. We're going to probably apply a lot of things, no, no evidence behind it, and we're going to regret it later on. Not only this, when you're using the hydrochloroxine uh, on these patients without evidence, you know, aside from the side effects and everything, now also you're depleting that drug from the, from the, from the market. And the patient who is already on, on this medication for, you know, years, and now they are not able to find this medication. Right. And also the public have access to this medication at the beginning. And that some of them died. And probably only had one case went on the media, but I'm sure there's multiple patients die because if they have risk and take the medication without any uh, physician recommendation, they end up dying from the side effects of that medicine. Okay, Are you saying you. Trump was wrong? Oh, well, I'm not saying, I'm not getting into politics. But <laughs> just... A question from my side, you know, you know, we all heard about uh, the herd immunity and we know that there's some country did not uh, enforce that social isolation, including Sweden and England. And we know that Boris Johnson got infected with the COVID and President Trump probably does not support social isolation. And actually it's killing the economy and it's creating a lot of depression cases and more suicide cases. And knowing that, uh, you know, we can't slow down the virus with the social isolation, probably you're gonna slow it down, but you're not gonna eliminate the virus. And ultimately either we're gonna get it or the, we're going to get vaccine or we're going to get some treatment for it. So knowing also that there's no economical value that we can impact on human life, what do you guys think about uh, releasing the social isolation, considering we're probably all going to get infected at one point? So can I, I'll, I'll, I'll just, let me put in one point and then I'll let somebody else talk. Uh, I've been reading about this actually. So the you know the St. Louis versus Philadelphia um, example that we look at for the 1918 Spanish flu. There's some documentation. Again, I think it's hard to show this in, in, in real numbers. That regions that were quick to react and shut down, aside from flattening the curve, were actually able to rebound back economically faster than than places that did not. And so I agree that you can't put a cost on this. It's impossible. This is like, you know, the concept of qualities, right? Like, you know, what, what is the value of one less death that is inevitable, you know, who knows, um, versus the, the destruction of our, uh, our, our, our current, currently strong or recently strong economy. I, I don't know what the answer to that is. But I, I think that, you know, overwhelming the healthcare systems and, you know, the amount of the, the, the tragedy that we've seen in Europe and especially in Italy uh, you know, that, that's going to have a toll. Uh, and I don't think that, you know, 
even if the same number of people, to your point, die, if, if we don't flood the healthcare systems, you know, aside from the fact that likely more people will die if they flood the healthcare systems, I think that it's, it's prudent to, to slow it down. Uh, yeah, the evidence is in favor of doing so, even economically. Right, right, right. And I agree with you also, like you asked, I mean, that, uh, the major benefit from doing the social distancing is not to preventing the infection completely. We cannot, as you mentioned, but it's just to, to flatten the peak so we can, you know, uh, uh, our health uh, care capacity be able to uh, treat these patients. Now, if you have all of this peak at a short period of time, then you probably end up with a lot of more mortality and, 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 and death. Compared if you flattening the diaphragm, you'll be able to go under the maximum capacity of our healthcare, and then you'll be able to treat this patient. Now, the story will be probably different if we are more prepared, you know, from the beginning. So if you had, I mean, more like, for example, headgears, you have more, you know, staff ready, you have more ICU beds, all of this, and you'll be ready, you can go with the first option. Uh, but I mean, if we are not ready, then we're better off flattening the diaphragm and prolonging this until we have you know, a solution no, until we have the vaccine, until we have the treatment that's supported by evidence too. Yeah, l let me just add one thing. If we had, uh, if we have available large amount of testing, then that would be different because then you can test everybody and those that are positive will go into quarantine and uh, uh, otherwise they, they, they don't have to. But that was, I think, m the main issue for us. If you look at South Korea and Singapore, that's what they did. They tested everybody and whoever is positive, they quarantined them. Now, uh, also, I think it's more than just flattening the curve. I mean, if you're elderly and you stay at home throughout the period and, and you don't get exposed, you probably protected yourself. So there is some protection um, in addition to flattening the curve. Yeah. Uh, I have one question from uh, one of the doctors. Uh, is there immunity? for COVID-19, if you develop it, are you gonna get it again or not? I know we don't have a clear data and I know Dr. Fauci probably talk about that, but from, I think from the behavior of other viruses from the same class, we think probably if you develop COVID, you're gonna have immunity to it unless there's some mutation. Yeah, and I mean, there's, uh, as far as we know, it's a stable virus, has not mutated yet. So as far as we know, you will have immunity and actually your blood will be gold because you can sell it and uh, get the, uh, hopefully will be useful. <laughs> okay, uh, another question. You know, we keep talking about the peak and the apex and they keep changing the peak and the apex. I don't know what kind of criteria they're using to do that. You know, like here in Ohio, we implemented the social uh, lockdown like one month ago. And we've seen significant decrease of cases and they keep saying we're going to have a peak in one or two weeks. How they decide about the peak and the apex in that disease? I don't know if you asked well. I can talk to some, yeah, some modeling. So uh, the, the SEER model is a basic model that basically tells you you have somebody with a risk of transmitting from what, you know, from one person to another. And, and it's a bit of an exponential development, assuming everybody's mingling together. Um, and then you subtract from that people that either, you know, have been infected or for whatever reason are not likely to get infected. And so there's actually, there's, the distribution is not purely exponential. It shoots up exponentially and then it kind of flattens because you've either infected everybody or they're dead, right? That, that, that's the general progression of the model. Um, depending on the assumptions that you plug into the model, how many people one person infects, and also the degree to which social distancing impacts uh, the or slows the spread, the R the R zero basically, the the one person to how many people question, um, that will impact the projection of the model. But I'm going to go back to the slide that I showed you. You know, if we had done unmitigated, we would have done exactly what uh, Italy and New York had done. We'd basically peaked, and then you know, sure, we would have had a really rough one or two weeks, and then everything would be done. More people would have died because the mortality risk is higher when when you're flooding the, the healthcare system that way. But the fact that we've flattened or slowed down, you know, the majority of people are still at risk out there. And so if we slip, you know, the policies that we put into place after this, as society reopens, are going to dictate how we do. So the expectation is we're going to see more of this. Uh, you know, the, it doesn't just do this and stop. You can have outbreaks. 
You know, those are just kind of smoothed out models. And I want to point out one more thing. You see the confidence intervals on some of those projections. The line is in the middle, and it's like, well, 50,000 deaths plus or minus 100,000 on each side. So it's hard to really model these things. It's hard to predict them. And I think I'm, I'm going to agree with Fauci. Like, models can kind of generally give you a sense with, you know, regarding how bad something could be. But at the end of the day, you know what works. You know, this has been exquisitely responsive to social distancing in Ohio. You know, just look at Ohio versus Michigan. I mean, we were maybe a week ahead in terms of our social isolation policies. And look at the difference that that created. Again, remember that early exponential phase. So I think the models tell you about more what works and what we can do to slow it down much more than here's how many people are going to die. Um, and that's, uh, that's at least my kind of modeling perspective on it. I think we have a lot of questions here and that are coming up for, for instance, for lung fibrosis. I, I see two questions. One of them, I think we already addressed about the hydroxychloroquine. Just they're asking yeah. what your experience in it. We know there it's mostly uh, anecdotal uh, data about it. And uh, I know some hospital, Ammar mentioned they use it in their hospital. And I think Abdul Ghani also, they use it in your hospital. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I can share if, uh, a, a, a management uh, protocol that our hospital has, but I think all hospitals have it. Uh, but yeah, we do use it um, on all patients hospitalized that are hypoxic, yeah. Anybody using the blood transfusion, the plasma, from uh, people who recover from COVID? Con con yeah, we're, we're writing a protocol for convalescent plasma. Yeah, so we haven't done it yet, but we're looking at it. It's not available for us yet, but I mean, when it become available, probably we'll use it. We are using the anti-interleukin-6. Mm -hmm. It's made specific for patients who have this uh, cytokine storm that they usually present with worsening of symptoms, very high fever, and they say their inflammatory markers are going up all of the sudden. So these patients may benefit from anti-interleukin-6. And we just tried on a, on a couple of patients so far. Okay. Um, and one of the things we, we are, you, we're, a, we're a big ECMO center. So we have maybe 12 patients on ECMO. And one of the interesting things that they are doing is they're extubating these patients prior to weaning from ECMO because they think they're, uh, it's, they're better off with extubation ra rather than being on a vent. And one important or interesting observation, and I don't know if it has any scientific data to it, all these patients are on Argutraban, not heparin. And I know we've talked about heparin and micro uh, thrombosis and many intensivists having to change the lines multiple times because of the thrombosis. So actually, our, uh, our surgeons went into our gutter band and they have not had any issues with that. I don't know what the scientific basis for it, but it's working. Okay. Uh, question. Uh, there's a question as well about fibrosis. Yeah, go ahead. Is that the question that you want to bring up? Yes. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Yasin. Yeah, so the question is, you know, uh, any idea whether the lung fibrosis is permanent or can it resolve? And, and the question being, even if, the, if you want to use evidence based on that, Think, yes, sir, your voice your voice is muffling a little bit is going off a little bit okay. oh sorry let me uh is that, is that better yeah yeah okay uh, sorry, I got, sometimes I go too fast, sorry, but uh, yeah, so for ARDS, the majority of people, you know, get through the illness without permanent damage. Uh, a, a small minority, I think 10 to 15 percent, correct me if I'm wrong, will have some degree of chronic lung disease, a restrictive lung disease attributable to ARDS. We don't know if that's going to be the case for COVID. I mean, if it's going to follow the same pathway, possibly. Uh, you know, obviously, we're going to find out. We're going to find out in the next few years. Okay. A question from one of the audience. Are you guys going to share the slides with the rest of the group? Can you? We're happy. To okay. Do yeah. Uh, you okay. can email it to me and I'll uh, send it to everybody else. If everybody can put their email on the chat box, whoever won the slides, we can send it to them. Uh, Question also, what do you guys think the true prevalence of COVID in the United States based on 
we think like 80% of the population probably had mild or asymptomatic, and we have 500 or half a million cases right now. Do you think we at least have like maybe 3 million or more infected people of COVID? And what's the role of the new test that's coming, the IgM and the IgG? Do you think that's gonna help identify people who were infected already? I can take probably the antibodies testing. It's basically antibody testing is gonna tell you about your immunity and we're gonna test for IgM and IgG. And, and it's gonna be used more for like uh, identifying patients that they can you know, go back to work when they develop immunity. So we know if they have immunity, they can go back to work, including healthcare workers. As you know, healthcare workers, a lot of them are getting infected now. So mm -hmm. probably they're gonna start testing with healthcare, healthcare workers so be able to return them back to work faster than what we're doing now. And the same, it can help us also to reopen up the country and have it under control as well. So when you do this antibody testing, you know who's immune, he can go back to work safely as well. Uh, any other question? Prevalence, we don't know, but I think if you want to guess, at least five times the, the, the uh, known infected people, because a lot of them are asymptomatic. It's just a guess, who knows? Okay, okay, okay. There's a lot of interesting data on that note. Uh, you know, some of, especially in Southern California, some healthcare systems have reached back into their uh, EHR and have found cases in, you know, as early as December uh, that, that have been kind of unspecified viral illness that in retrospect look like they could have been COVID. So, so I agree. I think we've had community spread in the U.S. probably longer than we thought. And I, this is another Fauci line, which is, you know, you take your temperature right now, you're already a month behind. You know, the, the, what we're seeing right now is a reflection of where we were a month ago. So we'll see how, how this develops. Okay, okay. Uh, let's see, if there's any other question? Orthopedic surgeon might be asking about the ventilator. Any books or article would you recommend to help get basic information about the ventilator? Well, nobody reads books anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you go online and you watch a video, I think it will be better. <laughs> I mean, there are many books about basic mechanical ventilation, but really go to, I think ATS now is offering a course, six hour course uh, about mechanical ventilation when you get certified. Okay. I think another question from Dr. Basil Taki about the ARDS, uh, study was done when mortality was 40% and it was reduced to less than 20%. And despite the usual use practice of ARDS, the treatment, the mortality is more than 50%. I'm seriously questioning the early intubation strategy. Any comment? Yes, I mean, now there, uh, there are a lot of questions about early intubation. And um, I think uh, the consensus now, and I don't know if any, everybody agrees with me, uh, if, you do not, if you do not have to intubate, put them on high flow, uh, then do that as long as you watch the patient carefully. Uh, I mean, we know, all know mechanical ventilation has its own uh, complications. And um, if you are able to avoid it, again, the, the, the key here is watch carefully, then I think the tendency is not to early intubate anymore. Okay, okay. Uh, and then I think part of that experience though, uh, you know, the issue is aerosolization. So if you have negative pressure ropes to spare, high, high flow is great. Um, I would prefer high flow any day. Uh, and I think that, you know, even I've, I've spoken to, to some of the docs in Italy uh, online, you know, they're, they're, they're choosing non-invasive positive pressure ventilation because, well, they don't have any more ventilators. So it's not that they think that necessarily it's, it's a better option, but I think they're stuck. They're at the point in the pandemic where, you know, essentially everybody's infected. And so trying to limit spread, and it's, it's, they're beyond that. So when the numbers are manageable and you can get a, a, a negative pressure room, absolutely, you can use non-invasive too. I think that's fine. That's two points here I want to mention too, probably one point we did not mention before, that these patients have increased work of breathing. If you see a COVID patient, they have all the same stereotype kind of presentation, especially when they get very sick. They are tachypneic. 
and they had increased work of breathing. And a lot of these patients, you know, they, 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 it's hard to reduce the work of breathing. And then there is a talk about that work of breathing is self-inflicting damage to the lung itself and to the patient. So if you, I mean, I mean, they just keep them on, on like uh, high flow. Sometimes you may help oxygenation, but you don't help the work of breathing. So that's one issue. And the other issue also, if you think about these patients like uh, uh, long-term, that's how they're gonna do. Now, a lot of these patients, they get sick for a long time. So like trying to have some options that may help them for a day or two, it may not work. That's what we end up in being intubating these patients. Add to this, this is probably not ARDS. You know, we are talking about, okay, we can try to compare it as ARDS, but it's not ARDS. There's much more than ARDS. That's why you see a higher mortality on these patients compared to ARDS patients. Okay, I think, uh, thank you very much guys for your time and efforts and it was excellent uh, presentation, was excellent discussion. We appreciate your help and uh, efforts. Uh, thank you everybody. I think we're reaching the end uh, with almost two hours into it. Thank you, Hazen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.